Over the last 60 years, over a thousand people have climbed to the top of Mount Everest. Hundreds of people have trekked to the North Pole. 12 people have walked on the surface of the moon. But so far, nobody's ever been to every country in the world without flying. Until now! Hi. <laughs> Hello, my name is Graham Hughes. On the 1st of, November, uh, 1st of January 2009, I set off on a quest. I crossed the River Plate from Argentina into Uruguay and got my first passport stamp of my journey to every country in the world without flying. It was a dream that I'd had since I was a child. Who doesn't want to go to every country? And it was something that throughout my adult life I was told time and time again it was impossible. Unless you were a millionaire or unless you were just absolutely crazy, it just could not be done. So I set off with an intention on this journey, not just to set a Guinness World Record, not just to raise money for charity, not just to encourage people to go travelling, but also to prove it could be done, to prove that the world is a lot more open than you realise. These places are accessible. The, the hardest place to get to in the world without flying is the Seychelles, which is a holiday destination. It's just hard to get to because it's in the middle of the Somali pirate zone, so getting there on a ship is tricky. <laughs> I set off, I started in South America, because my idea was to do the Western Hemisphere, head over to Europe, go through Africa, go to the Middle East, Asia, down to Australia. I didn't have a clue how I was going to do the Pacific. I'll come to that in a minute. So I headed up to the Caribbean. And this is my first snag. It only took me two weeks to get to all the countries, all 12 countries, all 12 nations of South America. But then I hit the 13 nations of the Caribbean and things slowed down a lot because there's no ferry services. There's no buses that you can get from one island to the next. You literally have to catch a ride on a yacht, on a cruise ship, on a cargo boat, on a banana boat, anything that floats that will take you. This is the Costa Fortuna. I catched a ride on this thing for one night to take me from the US Virgin Islands over to the Dominican Republic. From there, I headed to Central America, then up to the United States. Uh, where I had difficulty up there getting into Cuba after that, but uh, I managed to get there in the end. Headed up to New York, as you can see there, and into Canada. This all took me about three months, and uh, at the end of March, I was on a ship heading over the, the Atlantic Ocean to Iceland, and I was doing pretty well. I had it in my head that I could get to all 200 countries that I had on my list. That was 192 members of the United Nations, plus Kosovo, Taiwan, Vatican City, Western Sahara and Palestine, some of which have got special observer status, some of which were ex-UN members, but most of whom are recognised by over 100 countries as nations. I also included the home nations of the UK as four separate nations, just to make a nice round total of 200, which I'll also come back to later. I whizzed around Europe in literally three weeks. I got to every single nation in Europe on the, on the trains. It was, it was amazing. It was incredible. I got to Africa at the end of April. And I thought, wow, Africa's going to be tricky. You know, it's taken me four months to get this far. I've been to 80 countries. You know what? It could take me a couple of months. I'm actually on camera saying it could take me a couple of months to do this. By the end of the year, I was still in Africa. It wasn't until the following summer, 18 months later, that I then ticked off the last country in Africa at the time, which was Eritrea. It took me a long time. Visas, shipping, getting to islands such as Cape Verde, the Sao Tome and Principe, Comoros, all these little places that you see on the map and no one really thinks about. They're very hard to get to. Um, but I endeavoured. Uh, my first experience was going to Tunisia where I was denied entry to uh, Algeria and Libya. I thought, oh, I'll, I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> then I headed around Spain, down to Portugal, and then back into Spain, and I got the train down through Morocco, and then down into Western Sahara. And that's when I hit my first major visa snag. I got through the whole of Western Sahara, got to the border of Mauritania, and I got knocked back at the border, because I didn't have a visa. In my book, in my guidebook, it said that I could buy a visa on the border. I couldn't. I headed all the way back up to Rabat, 2,000 kilometres north, got myself a visa, headed back down to Dakla, down to Western Sahara, got to the border, and once again they were selling visas on the border. The guy who crossed the border with me, one of these guys here, they got their visas on the border, whereas I had to go all the way back to mine. And to add insult to injury, 
My visa was more expensive. It cost me $25, doesn't it? It cost $20. Then I hit Senegal. I got on this boat to get to Cape Verde. I couldn't find any other way. And I'm going to show you what happened on the way to Cape Verde. We're well on the way on our brogue. And we're in the middle of open ocean, as you can see. I saw a shark earlier. I saw a shark fin. And you can possibly see how much we're rocking about. I don't know how far we've gone or how close we are. All I know is that I'm soaking wet, I'm filthy, my face is sunburnt, my feet are sunburnt, the back of my hands are sunburnt. Oh, so this is my bed for the night. I've got a, a yeah. what's it called? A, hello. I've got a life jacket as my pillow and I've got my uh, sleeping bag, but my sleeping bag is soaking wet, as is my hair and all my clothes. Glad to know that I haven't been sick again and I'm keeping my cheery uh, disposition despite the fact that I'm absolutely shitting bricks. We're about 135 miles now from any kind of land. In the middle of the ocean, on a boat with 10 people who don't speak a word of English, and everything's made of wood. We don't have a sail or oars or a radio. Well, here we are, Cape Verde. Come on, guys, take us in before the police come and arrest us. We're now waiting for the police to get on board. If only we were coming. I don't want to film them because you know what coppers are like with being filmed. There's a copper and there's a there's a, an army guy. At this point, Graham's camera is confiscated. no porto da praia, uma embarcação clandestina com 10 passageiros da costa africana e um inglês. Os imigrantes dizem que apenas acompanharam o europeu, que diz ser um aventureiro e que não pretendem ficar no país. Nós não viemos para cá ficar. O inglês pediu-nos para acompanhá-lo, mas depois regressamos ao Senegal. Não viemos aqui para viver. Os jovens imigrantes já foram encaminhados à esquadra de Eugênio Lima para prestarem esclarecimento às autoridades. So they let me out of jail six days later. Um, and then the, the, the fisherman was sent home and I was, had to remain in Cape Verde. I spent six weeks there. I was rescued by these guys, Milan and Sebastian. Milan was German, Sebastian was French. They took me on their boat. They came from one of the other Cape Verde islands to pick me up and take me back to Africa, which was amazing. And then I headed off through Africa, full pelt. I was like, OK, I've just wasted six weeks in Cape Verde. I've, I've got to really get back on the pace now if I'm going to finish this job in a year. I got on the buses, headed through Mali, headed through Guinea. I got through Nigeria, no problems. Got through Cameroon, got to Gabon, got stuck there trying to get to Sao Tome Islands. Again, it was difficult, but I, I found a nice, friendly Belgian guy called Mark who took me over there. Uh, and, um, and then I got to Congo, and would you believe it, lightning struck again. I got thrown in jail for another six days, and this time I didn't have some friendly Senglis fishermen to share the cell with me. This time I was on my own, and it was, it was quite scary. But I was too angry at the time, you know, what the injustice of it, because I had a visa, I had a reason to be there, I had a visa for Democratic Republic of Congo to the south. There's no reason for them to keep me, so it was, it was quite a frustrating experience. But after six days, the, the, uh, the honorary consul, the British consul, uh, came and basically rescued me by saying to the chief of police, if you don't let this guy go, because he hasn't done anything wrong, I'm going to sit in your office uh, for the rest of the day, rest of the night, I'm not going to leave. And so they eventually let me go, which was absolutely fantastic. This was when I was in Gabon there, you saw a little bit where I joined the Buiti tribe, uh, which is quite interesting. This heading over to Sao Tome and Principe. It's a little island on the, on the equator. Really friendly people, really lovely people. This is me heading towards Congo. One of the things that really, strung, really struck me as I was traveling is that it's very easy to sort of look at the world through the, world, through the media and think, oh, you know, this, this is a terrible place, there's terrible things happening here. But one lot of the things that you see is what the governments are getting up to rather than the people. And one of the things that I found everywhere is that you can't judge people by the actions of their governments. 
And I just found the friendliest people everywhere who, who were willing to help me out, willing to look after me. I buzzed all the way around uh, Africa. And by the end of the year, I had made it to Egypt, uh, which was the end of year one. I'd been to 133 countries at this point, and I was feeling pretty good about myself. Uh, I thought, you know, maybe another six months, I'll have this, this job finished. I've only got another 70 countries to go. Uh, unfortunately, most of those countries were in Central Asia, and they were very difficult to get to because of visas, again, which took a long time to get. And I was doing this on a shoestring budget. I was staying with local people everywhere I went to keep down the cost of hotels. I was hitching rides on, uh, on, on uh, cargo ships whenever possible. And there's me in, in this is uh, Iran. I spent four days in, in Kurdish Iran. Uh, uh, sorry, Iraq, actually, that's Iraq. Um, and, you know, it was one of those things, you know, in, in the guidebook it says solo travellers, you'd have to be mad to go to Iraq. But I had sussed it out beforehand and made sure that where I was going was safe. This is heading up to uh, Central Asia here. This is all um, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan. And then I headed through to Iran. And Iran was a real eye-opener. As soon as I got in, I was made to feel the most friendliest, most hospitable welcome that I've ever had to a country. And everyone fell over themselves to help me out. And I was on an overnight bus one night, uh, going from the place of Shiraz to Kormamshah on the Shatalara waterway. And there I met this old lady here, uh, this is Saeed's grandmother. And she was sitting in front of me on the bus. And she didn't speak a word of English. It was an overnight bus, and she gave me her mobile phone. And I didn't know why, I just sort of picked it up and said hello. And the guy on the other end said, hi, my name is Saeed, you're sitting behind my grandmother. And she's rang me because she's concerned about you. And I said, well, why is she concerned about me? And at this point, I had not spoken to her or anything. She was just sitting in front of me. So he said, because the bus gets in very early tomorrow morning, about five, half five, and she's worried you'll have nowhere to go and no one to cook you breakfast. So she wants to know if it's okay with you, if she can take you home with her so she can cook you breakfast. <laughs> Would this be acceptable? And I was like, yes! You know. <laughs> Faith in humanity, restored. Ding, 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 ding. So then, <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> so then I headed through the Indian subcontinent, through uh, Bhutan to Nepal, over the Himalayas, into Tibet. This is Tibet up there. I've got a headache like crazy up there with the altitude. And then I headed down on the train to Beijing, and I got around to all of the sort of Southeast Asian countries pretty quick. I cheated a little bit going into North Korea. I just went to the demilitarized zone and literally just sort of stepped across the border like this and went, oh, I'm in North Korea, and then ran back. <laughs> Bit of a cheat, there I am, that's me in North Korea. But the thing is, I, I, I could have spent a thousand dollars going on a tour of Pyongyang for a few days, but I didn't have the money to do that, so this is, this is the, what you get when you're traveling on a budget. And one of the things I was stressing while I was doing this journey to people who were writing to me saying, I want to go traveling, I want to do this kind of thing, is it's not that expensive. It really isn't. And it's the number one question I get asked is, how did you afford to do this? And I'll tell you now, I spent 27,000 pounds on this journey over the course of four years. That's your rent, a cigarette habit, and, and a pet right there, you know? And I didn't spend it on those, I spent it on traveling, which to me was, was more important. I got to Papua New Guinea, and this is when the wheels kind of fell off my journey. I've been traveling for two years, I've been to 184 countries, I only had 16 left. I got terrible news from the UK that my sister had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. So I hopped on a plane in Australia, flew back to, to England to be with her, and she asked me not to give up. I only had 16 countries left to go. So I kept going. It took a while to get back on the horse, but when I did, I got cargo ships all around the Pacific. As you can see here, this is me in Vanuatu. And I really pressed on to those final 16 countries, which had become 17 countries because South Sudan had become an independent nation <laughs> while I was traveling. <laughs> so my idea was, I got to New Zealand. That was supposed to be my final destination. And what I decided was I was going to head back to my hometown of Liverpool without flying from New Zealand and hit the dozen or so nations that I'd missed along the way on the way back. So I headed up to Palau, went to the Federated States of Magnesia, headed to um, Sri Lanka, spent a long time in Sri Lanka waiting for a ship that could take me to the Maldives and the Seychelles because of the aforementioned Somali pirate situation. I couldn't do my usual trick of hitching a ride on a cargo ship like there. And it took, it took a while. So just to give you some idea of this, the first two years I was traveling, I went to 184 new countries. In the last two years I was traveling, I went to 17. 
And it's just because of the time difference. You know, trying to get to somewhere like Nauru in the Pacific Ocean, there's one cargo ship that goes to Nauru from Brisbane in Australia, and it goes every five weeks. And if you don't get on that ship, you're not getting to Nauru. There's no port there. It's a potato-shaped island. There's no, there's no harbour. There's no way you can get your sailboat in there or anything. So it was just a case of blagging it a lot of the time and turning up with these shipping officers and just basically begging to get on these boats. That was my journey around the world all the way to New Zealand. This is me in New Zealand here. And um, like I say, it was time to head back. I got to South Sudan on November the 26th last year. And that was my final country. It was very exciting to get there. Uh, it was a hell of a mission because obviously I had to get back to Africa. I had to make my way up from South Africa all the way up to South Sudan, which is surprisingly easy, which is a bit odd. I, I expected it to be a lot harder, but it only actually took a few days. Then from South Sudan, I had to make my way back to Liverpool, as I promised, and I managed to get back for December the 21st, which some of you might know was uh, the end of the world, apparently, last year. Um, I like to think that I stopped the world from ending by, by doing this journey. Uh, this, is, this is Nauru, actually, just going back there. Yeah, there's the Nauru flag. These are the guys I was on the ships with. I was on about 20 of these you know, major, major ships, which was quite exciting. There's, there's uh, Neptune there coming on board. This is the crossing the equator ceremony. That's the, the, the captain there shaving my head, uh, making me drink salt water with some vodka in and tomato juice, and spraying me down. And... <laughs> oh, the high jinks you get up to on a ship when there's no women around. <laughs> so... <laughs> so the main message I learned from this journey and the thing that, you know, the idea that I want to share with you is that the world isn't this big scary place. It's out there. Most of you possess British passports or European passports or American passports. They are an access all areas pass to the world. And you've only got it one chance to use that. So these countries that you've always dreamed of going, start doing it. The hardest decision is to go. Once you've made that decision, you're paying for your flights. Once you get there, places are usually pretty cheap. In Africa, it costs about a dollar to go 100 kilometers. Here we have the end of my journey. This okay, is South Sudan. I am now in South Sudan, the 201st and last country of the Odyssey expedition, which I've been on for the last three years, 10 months, and 26 days. And now it's over. I finish it in the newest country in the world. Boom! <laughs> Here's to South Sudan! Woo! I am now the first person in the world to visit every country without flying. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much. Woo! Right, now for sandwiches! Woo! So just have to say um, thank you very much for listening to me. And if you've got any questions for me, I'm going to be milling around in the foyer afterwards. So just come over. Quite a friendly guy. And uh, maybe I'll help you hit the road one day. OK, thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>